Shari Langemark, Medscape, Germany. The future is already here. Digital innovations that will change healthcare forever. All right, as we are very strict about time policy and to increase my personal chances to get one of the bonus hearts, I start already right away, right? So as we are talking so much about the future of medicine and about predictions today, I would like to start with how good we actually were predicting the future in the past. And this is an article that Timo Lammert found in his parents' house just a few years ago and probably dates back to the late 80s, early 90s. And the author tries to examine what role computers could play in daily people's life. Well, it's unfortunately in German, but I think by translating the title and the main conclusion of the author, we already learn quite a bit of his opinion. So the title reads, Computer, Hobby of the Future. And the conclusion of the author is, the question is, why? So why do we need computers? You can simply write everything with your hand. Well, I think the recent past and the present has shown that there are actually purposes for computers beyond writing. And to be honest, in my daily practice, it becomes quite uh, practical to write on my computer. So now you might think, well, that's a great example of ignorance somebody could be towards technological progress. I, however, think our perception of innovation hasn't changed much in the past 20, 30 years. Let me give you one example. Every time I talk about the future of medicine, I'll still hear questions like electronic health records. You can simply use paper-based records. See the similarity there? Or artificial intelligence. Why? Isn't a doctor good enough to find the right diagnosis anymore? Or something like telemedicine. Why? Isn't it too dangerous to treat patients over distance? Don't get me wrong here. Um, it's definitely good to ask a question about a new technology. It's important to discuss it. But the problem is that somebody's asking the wrong question. Asking why we need artificial intelligence now is just as ignorant as asking why we needed computers back then. The question isn't why. The question is how. How do we want to use AI in our daily medical practice? How do we want um, to implement electronic health records worldwide? And how do we ensure a high quality of care in telemedicine? So I would like to encourage you to keep that thought in your back mind while listening to my talk and especially while listening to all these great innovators coming afterwards. So I mentioned the first topic I would like to show you already before AI um, is a game changer in healthcare. The reason is we have so much research going on worldwide, like hundreds of thousands of studies are published every year and it's very hard for a physician to keep up with this pace. Computers, on the other hand, um, can analyze hundreds of studies within minutes. Like, for example, Watson, IBM supercomputer. IBM, has, IBM supercomputer has a cancer analytics unit and it currently analyzes more than 290 medical journals, more than 200 textbooks, and 12 million pages of text. So how can we profit from that? And I want to give you three examples of the main stakeholders in our healthcare system to see how use this could mean for us. The first in, in stakeholder in the system, of course, is the physician. And there has been a long-term collaboration between IBM and the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And they've been working on different ways to support oncologists in their daily medical practice. One of the most recent one is probably Onco Knowledge Space. It ha just has been launched a few weeks ago, and it tries to help oncologists to identify the right treatment for a certain genome. So this, um, Watson in this case, would analyze approximately 100 studies, 100 new studies every month to find the right treatment for each tumor gene. 
Another example for um, stakeholders who could profit from AI is industry, of course. And we see that from an increasing number of industry partners of Watson. One example I want to show you is Teva Pharmaceuticals, an Israeli pharma company who tries to identify new indications for already existing drugs. And the reason is obvious, right? Because pharma spends a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of um, effort in research and development by finding new indications for already existing drugs. They, of course, could highly increase their profit. And the most important stakeholder who could profit from AI, in my opinion, is the patient. With AI, we finally have the chance to introduce truly personalized medicine. Why? Because we can finally take all these different factors into account that make a person special. Factors like comorbidities, that is other diseases of the patient, as we've seen before. Factors like the tumor genome, the patient genomes, the treatment preferences of each patient, or even new things like the microbiome. Of course, if we want to take all these different factors into account, we first and foremost need a lot of data. That is data on each specific um, characteristic we want to analyze. And in the past, it was quite difficult because we didn't have that much data. For example, we know that women react quite differently to certain drugs than men. In this new era, in the era of the smartphone, however, everybody becomes a subject of research. Not only by analyzing electronic health records, but also by analyzing apps, fitness apps, medical apps, and something that I find quite exciting, research apps. You've probably heard all about the research kits, Apple's framework for researchers, which allows them to enroll participants worldwide, a, vi a wide range of very um, many participants with very different characteristics. And to give you some impression on how many participants you can actually gain by using such an app, just a few weeks after launching, the research kit already gained 60,000 participants. I wanted to present you um, one example um, from Stanford Medicine. It's also a quite recent example, um, just very few weeks old, and uh, it aims at patients with peripheral vascular disease. For those of you who don't have a medical background, so this disease um, basically leads to a patient who is able to walk longer distances anymore. So the maximum distance he is able to walk is reduced over time, and of course, that can be quite a burden to run your daily errands. This app is actually quite simple. It simply tracks how long you can walk and when you need to stop. And by that, um, it gives instant feedback, instant feedback to the researchers, what kind of treatment might work, what kind of treatment might not work in this specific patient with this specific characteristic. It gives instant feedback to the physician who maybe wants to adjust treatment, and it gives instant feedback to the patient who gets encouraged by that. I really like this first review on the App Store um, where a patient really says, okay, this app doesn't only contribute to research, it encourages me to keep up with my daily walking. And we all know compliance can be quite difficult in many diseases. What we often forget about, however, is that patients want to be healthy, patients want to be engaged, and patients want to play an active role. And I believe the digitization finally gives them the right tools to do so. The digitization does that in three main ways. First of all, it allows patients to buy medical devices. Secondly, it allows patients to monitor their disease on their own, 24-7. And thirdly, it allows patients to finally understand what's going on in their body. Let's take a deep, deeper dive into that. There are probably many different prices for an ECG monitor. This is one at the lower end I found for a professional ECG monitor, but I think we can all agree that professional medical devices can be quite expensive. 
As a patient, you would probably not buy such a device, especially because it's way too difficult to use. In this new era, however, we see more and more devices who target specifically at the patient. They're easy to use and they are quite inexpensive. For example, this one, the Live Core Monitor, doesn't co even cost one tenth of the price of a professional device. So if patients are finally able to buy medical devices, they are also finally able to monitor their disease. And by monitoring, I don't even mean that they track their diseases maybe every now and then, maybe every week, but oftentimes continuously. We see more and more wearables like this contact lens that helps patients to track their disease constantly. You've probably all have heard about the Google contact lens for diabetes patients. I wanted to present you a different example that I qu found quite interesting. This is a Sensimed contact lens that helps um, patient with glaucoma, an eye disease that leads to a, a decreasing um, loss or increasing loss in eyesight um, to monitor how fast their disease is progressing and thereby the physician can adjust treatment on time and furthermore can make better prediction. And lastly, of course, if I as a patient would um, track my disease, I also want to understand what's behind that data. And also, this new era allows patients to finally understand what's behind their data. This is um, one random example out of many. Uh, many apps translate data into beautiful graphics and give the patient on-time feedback on what's going on in their body and give them on-time advice how to improve their condition. The other example I chose for you is Jerry the Bear, and I think it shows perfectly how well these devices are adapted um, at their user. In this case, children, by playing with the bear, just doing what mommy does with them, they learn how to behave in diabetes or what they need to do on their own later. So to give you some short conclusion on um, what's going on in the digital health world right now, I think with the digitization, patients are finally truly empowered because they can finally buy medical devices, they can finally track their own disease, and they can finally understand what the data actually means. Furthermore, research get more help through digitization as well as they can reach broader populations with more specific characteristics. And lastly, the physician gets support through digital health as he can bring research into clinical practice right away. So, if I may make one wish today, I would like to wish for that nobody in this room asks a question like that. And I especially don't want to read an article with a title on it. Digital health is not a hobby, it's not a trend, it's nothing just for the young people and it won't stop. It's as simply as this, digital health is the future, it's our future and I would like to encourage you to not to build any new barriers but rather to embrace all these great talks you will hear afterwards with an open heart and an open mind. Thank you.